two friends, Alan Dale and Jerry Carew, who grew up just a few streets apart in St. John's East End, have been separated by Canada's geography for three decades. They came together virtually during the pandemic to chat about like-minded interests. Alan lives in PEI and Jerry in Newfoundland. Thriving in remoteness has been a common theme for both of them during the pandemic. Gale Force wins. The podcast is the result. Hi, and welcome to Gale Force Wins. You know, I always enjoy meeting passionate people, people that really are excited about something in their life. Well, our next guest is no exception. He is an accomplished anesthesiologist. He's dipped his toe in military service with the Prince Edward Island Regiment, and now he joins us to talk about his passion for beekeeping. We're certainly excited to have Dr. Steve Farmer on the podcast with us today. Welcome to Gale Force Winds. Uh, I'm Alan Dale, and with me as always, Jerry Crew. How are you today, Jerry? Alan, doing really well. We had our first little snowfall here in St. John's uh, yesterday, uh, 25 centimeters. This time last year, uh, we got one storm with uh, 95 centimeters, and it was already about 40 centimeters on the ground, and it took seven days of a state of emergency to clean that up. Uh, Yesterday, it took uh, two hours to clear my, my driveway. I think last year, it took about eight hours. So uh, I'm feeling a little bit invigorated. Being out in the weather, it's, the sun is shining. So I'm feeling good to talk about bees with Steve. Well, listen, that's great, Jerry. And uh, just, I know that we don't like to date the podcast, but it is January in Canada. But 60 centimeters of snow in Newfoundland could come in July as well. So this is kind of timeless. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, it's a, we've got a very unusual conversation we're going to have today. It's a little bit different than the ones that we normally have. But what we find is that we bring on guests to the podcast that are interesting uh, and they're normally passionate about something. And that indeed is the case for our, our next guest. Uh, we're very excited to have Dr. Steve Farmer on the podcast with us. Now, Steve is an accomplished anesthesiologist. He's dipped his toe in military service with the Prince Edward Island Regiment, but he has a real passion for beekeeping. And I'm really excited to hear all about that because Every time Steve is in a room and he's talking about beekeeping, he really captivates the audience. And I'm hoping that's what we get here today. Steve, welcome to the podcast. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, Alan. Hi, Jerry. Yeah, uh, I'm Stephen Farmer. Uh, I live here in uh, Harrington, Prince Edward Island with my wife, Heather McKinley, and our, our three daughters. And uh, about 10 years ago, uh, yeah, I, I drove up the road told Heather I was just going to buy one beehive and I came back with 10 or came back with two and then that winter we uh, we wrapped five and uh, uh, unfortunately it's 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 gone from there so uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I tend to be someone who get, gets interested in something and uh, then six months later um, yeah I'm, I'm tired of that I'll try something different but this has been unusual that, that I've stuck with this for 10 years and uh, and uh, I imagine it'll be a large part of my sort of segue out of anesthesia and uh, and sort of a, a, a semi-retirement sort of thing. But yeah, how do you how do you how do you go from being an anesthesiologist by day, yeah. beekeeper weekend night? How does that transition happen? Um, I, I, I think I think part of, like I've always been interested in. And you know, I did biology in, in, in university. grew grew up on a on a on a small small farm. You know, had horses, sheep, chickens, all that sort of thing. So you you always had that sort of you know tie in tie in with nature and 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 the world around you and caring for animals and 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 realizing you know to to a large part where you, where your food came from and that that sort of thing. Um, always always enjoyed uh, bird watching and, and time spent in, in 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 nature and so when like 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 many people when when you're when you when you put all your energy into your nine to five job whether that's 40 50 60 70 hour, hours a week you need something to transition to you need uh you, you need something to change change your focus and and different people have have different different hobbies mine has always been sort of 
the outdoors or doing 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 things with with my hands um uh you know we were joking before this started you know i'm not i'm not the type of person to to, to golf or 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 things like like that so um yeah it's it's it, it uh it, it, some, 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 some things you get into are a little hard to explain. Sometimes they, they just, just happen, but uh, certainly, um, certainly it's a good way to un, un, unwind. Nobody bugs you when you're out working your bees. You've, you've got time. <laughs> yeah. You've got, you've got time to yourself. <laughs> right. I guess. Yeah, that, that's yeah. true. Right. Everybody has yeah. different outlets, right? I mean, yeah. for me, I, I, I play music and Jerry plays music yeah. as well. Yeah, uh, that's a great outlet, and uh, you're right. It's uh, it's kind of something you do that you're passionate about, and that you're in your zone when you're doing it. I know I feel great when I'm playing the drums, and I'm just yeah. kind of to myself. I'm doing something. I mean, you're part of something for sure. Yeah, but you're, it's a really neat feeling, Jerry. I'm sure you feel the same way when you're playing the trumpet. Uh, absolutely, yeah. No, it, it, a guy said to me one time, you know, when you have these passion projects. Uh, besides what you do nine to five, you use a totally other part of your brain and it's kind of makes you rest. Yeah. I got a question, uh, yeah. Steve, you, you say you, you went out and, and you, you bought a beehive, a whole host of questions come to me. First of all, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't, can you describe what a beehive is? Like, is it in a jar? Is it a big thing? And, and secondly, how do you even source a beehive? I can't even. Yeah. Uh, well, um, so, so at, at, at work, I work at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and, and one of the um, urologists there who has since retired, he was a beekeeper as, as, as well. And when we, we moved here, um, uh, we had a swarm land in, in the birch tree and, and a swarm isn't an aggressive, it sounds aggressive, but it's, it's just the, um, the colony, uh, whether it's wild or whether it's coming out of a, a commercial hive, it's just a colony trying to reproduce itself and it's looking for a new home. Um, and so they've got other things on, 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 on their mind than, than, than uh, bugging humans. So they were a big ball of bees up in the tree and I called Murray and he came out uh, with his white bee suit. The kids still remember this, him putting his white bee suit out, up and going up in the tree and getting a swarm and putting it in a, in a box. So when, when I decided I wanted to get a, I fortunately had that sort of contact and uh, I asked Murray Murray told me Stan Sandler, um, he's a very prominent beekeeper. He probably runs about 3,000 hives. He's down on the eastern end of the island. He had an apiary uh, up at the uh, uh, government, the experimental farm here in Harrington. He overwintered hives there. So I got in contact with him and it was April uh, and I went up and met him up there and he helped me load uh, load uh, the hives in the back of our pathfinder <laughs> not the most ideal piece of uh, beekeeping equipment to, to to carry your bees home it's better off to have a pickup truck so they're open in the back and not buzzing around with you inside the enclosed uh, vehicle but <laughs> I, I wore my bee suit home and uh, and uh, with them in the car and and, and we unloaded them but uh, yeah so commercial hives um, they're, 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 they're in uh, wooden boxes, R roughly the measurements. The boxes are uh, usually made out of pine and, and they're, you know, 20 by 16 by nine, nine and a half high. They're on a bottom board. They've got a lid and, and hives vary in sizes. Um, um, the ones I bought had two boxes. They're referred to as, you know, double deeps or, 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 or a, a double brood hive. Um, yeah, so that's what we started out with. Uh, I, I, you know, I told Heather, I was my wife Heather, I was just going to uh, go up and buy a single hive. I came back with two, and uh, it, it went from there. But uh, so, so you're buying the boxes. You're not actually the bees came from the no, naturally occurring bees. No, sorry, no, the bees are in the hive. So this is I'm, I'm buying a box, a box of bees. The, if you take off the lid. You'll, you'll see um, uh, vertical, uh, you'll see wooden bars hanging down from those wooden bars uh, are either a, a wax foundation or a plastic foundation that the bees have drawn their honeycomb uh, off of. And you can pry those frames up, you can lift the frame out, you can examine the, the comb, you can examine the bees, you can look for the queen. And that, that's really what revolutionized uh, beekeeping 
um, in, in the mid 1800s, uh, the, the, the gentleman correct, uh, the gentleman uh, given credit for uh, inventing the modern sort of beehive, uh, Lorenzo Langstroth is his, is his name, uh, he was a, a minister. Um, he discovered the bee space, the concept of the bee space. And, and if you have a, 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 a space of three eighths of an inch or eight to nine millimeters, the bees will keep that open. Anything smaller, they fill up with propolis, which is their version of uh, uh, weather stripping and caulking, right? To seal any cracks, to keep out the cold and the drafts. Anything bigger than that, they'll, they'll put honeycomb in there so that they can store uh, honey uh, or, or, or pollen, you know, their, their fuel to, to get the, um, the hive through the, the lean times. So uh, prior to that, people were keeping bees in straw skeps or hollow wooden structures, and they would either shake the bees out or kill the bees, and, and, and harvesting the honey was, you know, a messy affair where they would uh, press the honeycomb to, to squeeze the honey out. With the advent of, of removable frames, by leaving this three-eighths uh, of an inch space around, the bees uh, wouldn't connect the frames to the sidewall of the hive. You could pull the uh, pull the frames out and inspect the, the bees. And unfortunately, that's, that's, that's very important in today's uh, beekeeping because of uh, uh, disease management. If it, it, you're not allowed to keep bees uh, in, in, in a, a container that you can't pull the frames out and examine for disease. Um, so yeah, so uh, there's all sorts of variations on that uh, theme. Um, I've, I've, uh, I've been to England, I, I, I haven't uh, had a chance to talk to beekeepers there and see all the different equipment they use, but I think they have a variety of different um, hive uh, boxes and styles and sizes. And uh, if you, any, any, if any, as soon as you go out of, the, uh, out of North America, you know, you run into all sorts of different shapes and sizes. But the one underlying principle is this, this uh, three eighths of an inch uh, bee space that uh, they don't, uh, so they don't glue the frames to the inside of the hive. Yeah. How many, how many bees are in a hive, Steve? Um, so uh, that, that varies from uh, the t t uh, month to month throughout the year. When they're at their peak, um, you're talking about 50 to 60,000 bees in, in a hive. And, wow. and the peak is probably, you know, coming on the end of, end, 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 end of uh, June, you know, July. Um, and that's they're, they're trying to build up this huge forager force to bring in resources uh, to, to store honey, to store uh, pollen, which is their protein source, so that they can survive the winter and start raising, raising brood again in February, March, April. When, uh, when your bees go into the winter, it's it's um, so so summer bees are actually really short short lived. They 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 us usually don't live more than six weeks, and they're just they're metabolic furnaces and they just burn themselves out. And their last role is is the foraging field bee, and the, and their wings just get tattered and uh, you know they 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 just run out of uh, I guess wings and energy. Um, but come September, October, the bees that are being raised that are hatching uh, then aren't, uh, they're your longer lived winter bees. And they have these big fat stores in their, in their abdomen, it's called Vitaligen. And that's the resource that, that, that carries them through the, uh, the winter. And when they start feeding uh, larvae uh, that grow into the new bees in, 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 in February and March, they, their physiology changes from a long-lived winter bee to uh, a shorter-lived bee, and their lifespan decreases, and they're consuming that, that vitaligen in, 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 in their body. Um, the vitaligen produces or, or serves all sorts of other functions. It, it, uh, it, 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 it sort of acts like their liver. It detoxifies uh, substance in, in, their, in their body, and it has a role in their uh, immune system as well. So there's a neat paper out there that uh, healthy bees are fat bees. So if your bees are well-fed, healthy, disease-free, uh, nice and plump going into the, the, the winter, you should be okay in, in, in the spring. But yeah, it's, I'm sorry, dancing around here, but it's anywhere between 10,000 and 50,000 bees. And it's, 
it's 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 a it's a constant sort of uh, flux, I okay. guess, is the best way to. How, how did so they're in this box? Yeah. How, how, so they get through the entire winter. Now, yeah. how do they survive that? I mean, like, th th there's no insulation in that box. Yeah, no. Other than what they make, or other than how they seal it up. But how do they keep? Like, I mean, that's how do you survive through that? So they 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 thermoregulate. They uh, once once uh, temperatures drop down into the five, you know, below ten degrees Celsius, um, you know, they start to cluster. And what clustering means is 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 that they come together in a ball, and in doing so, they keep the center of the ball, and and it, it, it's probably a volleyball sized uh, ball, maybe a little bigger at the start of the. Uh, start of the winter um, and they, they, they generate metabolic heat by consuming the honey and they vibrate their, um, their flight muscles which are in their thorax. They don't move their, their wings but they vibrate these muscles. It's like a shivering and it generates heat and so they'll keep the center of the cluster I think you know 28, 29 degrees Celsius um, to, to, to keep the you know because they want to keep uh, the, the queen alive uh, and then when she starts laying eggs and and they're having to keep the larva warm the temperature bumps up another couple de degrees i think at a 31 32 degree range so they're keeping you know it can be minus 20 outside and they've got the center of this uh, volleyball sized cluster um, humming away at 32 degrees celsius raising young bees now on the outside the bees have cooled down there's a mantle and they cool down to about five degrees Celsius and then, then head back in. If, if, they, if they stay at five degrees long or, or if they drop below that, I think that's, that's, that's lethal for the, for the girls. But so they're sort of like the penguins in Antarctica. The, the, the cold ones in the outside, they migrate to the, to the inside and the warm ones, uh, uh, you know, get pushed to the outside. So, you know, it's, 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 it's fascinating. And, and you have to wonder how, you know, the evolutionary process that 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 drove this development not only just the, the the communication that that we're only beginning to understand in social insects uh like like the honeybee but this physiology and it's not it, it it's not present in in all the uh, races of, of of honeybees so you probably all heard about africanized honeybee it, it is scutatella is its, its subspecies name it, it came from 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 africa it was introduced to brazil because italian honeybees in, in in the warmer climates in south america just weren't i guess producing enough honey or doing well so they tried to make hybrids with an african honeybee to see if they could 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 spruce that up a bit. Anyways, they had escapes uh, and, and Africanized honeybees have sort of marched up South America, Central America into the Southern US. But they don't cluster. They cannot tolerate cold, cold uh, climates. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's why they, they probably won't get any farther than you know, the middle of the continental United States because they don't cluster and they'll die in, in the cold. So it's just another example, not only is, is it, are honeybees as a group fascinating, but then the different behaviors that develop within subspecies or races that have been isolated from each other over the, well, m millennia is, 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 is fascinating. So one queen in each hive? Yeah, yeah, one, one queen in each hive. Um, you will find, I think, 10 or 15% of hives in the spring will have a mother queen and a daughter queen. What happens is the hive can recognize when the, when the, the, the queen is failing, running out of, uh, of, of, of sperm um, and, and not laying uh, as well as she was. And they will then raise a new queen uh, from one of the eggs that she's she's laid, um, so uh, you know there, you never say never and you never say always. So there is a proportion of uh, hives in the spring that will have two, but as a general rule, yeah, it's a one woman show in, in in there. Yeah, one one queen. Wow. So spring comes around. They yeah. Leave, they leave that hive. Where do they go? How do they how do they get out and do the work? Yeah, so so there? spring spring comes spring's a spring's a beautiful full time a beautiful time. Um, it's I mean a lot of people equate it with you know like rebirth and things emerging and that sort of thing. And I think every beekeeper is just praying for the first dandelion. <laughs> but but before the dandelions, what you'll see is the bees coming out like a warm day in April. 
there, 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 there can be snow on the ground, but if the alders have bloomed, you know, alders and willows, that's the first protein source. And that's what, the, that's what they need. Um, so, so honey, the nectar, that's their carbohydrate source. And they'll get some trace minerals and elements and that. But, but what, what, what really drives growth of, of the colony is, is the protein, protein source. And so, you know, nice warm spring day, you'll just, I'll just go out and, and sit down by the hive and you just see the stream of bees coming back and they've packed the pollen in the little pollen baskets on their, their hind legs. And, uh, uh, and all the, you know, later on in the spring, summer, you see all the different colors coming in, but in, in the first bit in the spring, it's, 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 it's pollen from the alders and the, uh, the, the willows. And so the hive at that point, um, all that you see leaving the hive are the worker bees bringing resources in because the, the, the queen is responding to that incoming, uh, uh, those incoming resources and she's trying to build up the population of the hive. It has to be a balancing act because if she lays too many eggs right. and there's not enough resources coming in, yeah. then her workers will go around and start cannibalizing those eggs and larvae. So, yeah, she has to lay in response to what the hive can support. And uh, so the initial uh, bit in the spring, they're, they're trying to build up their numbers. If it's a really good spring, and this is usually in May, about the time that the dandelions are blooming, if that hive is booming um, and they're crowded and there's lots of re resources, then that triggers what's called the swarm impulse. Okay. And, and that's when the hive uh, wants to reproduce as a colony so that the, the species, you know, survives. It, 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 you just create more, more uh, uh, colonies because it's not the individual bee, right? The queen is laying individual bees, but that individual bee can't go out and create a worker bee, can't go out and create its own colony. So when the colony's crowded and there's, there's lots of resources coming in, um, the, 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 uh, the bees uh, uh, sort of herd the queen to lay in specially prepared queen cups. They then, that larva hatches and the worker bees lavish uh, the, 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 the larva with, with copious amounts of royal jelly. And that's what determines uh, a, a queen uh, being produced. All, all larvae for the first three days get royal jelly, then they get a more dilute, less nutritious food and they grow into worker bees. But if the, the, the worker bees continue to supply the growing larva with a royal jelly, then you get a larger a bee that will become the queen. She hatches um, after, uh, and after about a week, uh, uh, kicking around the hive, she goes out on a mating flight. And that is really the only time she leaves the hive over the next two or three days is to mate. And she'll mate with up to 20 drones. And she stores uh, the sperm in an organ called a spermatotheca. And that's what she relies on for the rest of her life to fertilize eggs. Because if wow. she wants to lay a female, she, she then lays a fertilized egg. If she wants to lay a male, she lays an unfertilized egg. So again, another just, just fascinating physiology. And, and it's the size of the... Um, the, 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 the cell that she puts her abdomen in that determines whether it's a, a fertilized or an unfertilized egg. The, drone, the drones are the males uh, and they're a bigger cell. And I'm not sure about the f anatomy or the physiology that determines it, but when she lays an egg, it's not fertilized when she's laying it in that larger diameter, diameter drone cell. But, so uh, this swarm goes out, they're looking for a new place to set yeah, up basically. Yeah. So, how do they decide? How, like, how does that process play out? So when, when the hive has decided it, it, it has the resources and the opportunity to, to propagate and, and they have, uh, they've herded the queen into uh, laying a bunch of queen cells. So you'd look into a hive, you think everything's fine, you look into a hive and you see five or six queen cells ready to hatch, right? You know that that hive's going to swarm. So if you don't intervene, what will happen, I think, in about a day, a day or two before the first queen comes out, the, 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 the queen, the mother queen that was in the, the hive, she'll leave with about 
30, 40% of her, her, her hive. And they'll go, they won't go far, but they'll go to an intermediate location, you know, three or 400 meters away. And that's often when people say that they saw a swarm, you know, this cloud of bees leave, leave, leave the hive, or they see a ball of bees hanging in, in, in a tree. And they'll be there for one to two or three days. Um, before they've left, all the workers, they've gorged themselves with honey um, because that's, that's their only way to take, take food for the, the trip. Um, they're also primed to produce a lot of wax. If you look at a worker there, they, 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 they make little flakes of wax that are under the scales uh, on, on their abdomen. Um, so they're all ready to find, they're all primed to find a new home, dry out honeycomb, start laying eggs and start a new hive. But they have no idea where they're going. And um, uh, Th Thomas Seeler uh, is a professor in, uh, in New York State at, at Cornell. He, he, he's done some of the more recent research and has a fantastic book and, and he's got, um, there's a video, uh, a, there's a lecture on, on, on YouTube for interested people to watch and he, he explains it much better than me. But he says out of that swarm of, of, of 10, 15, 20,000 bees, um, there would be 300, 400 scouts. And they, they fly off singly and they're exploring trees, uh, buildings, cracks and crevices, and they're looking for a, 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 a hollow cavity of about 40 liters, about 15 feet up a tree, facing south, um, uh, with about a, a, a three inch uh, square uh, entrance. Um, and so as you might imagine, they're kind of hard to find, so it takes a bit of searching. And the bees actively explore these cavities and then come back to the, um, to, 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 to the swarm that's hanging in the tree. And they then pass on the information of where this is located. And they do it the same way as they do their waggle dance in the hive if they found a good nectar source. And, and there's, there's little films of this and it's fascinating to watch because the bee is on the honeycomb and she starts a little vibrating dance. And then she circles back around and she starts again. And she circles around and she starts again. And, and the other scouts are watching her, okay? And she's indicating, uh, basically, if she was to go straight up, um, she would say, head to the sun, the direction is the sun. If she's 15 degrees to the left, she's saying, come out and head 15 to deg degrees to the, to, 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 the, to the, to the, to the, to the left or the right of the sun, whichever way. So she's giving a bearing to her scouts when they come off the swarm. And the dur duration of her dance is how far to go. And two seconds is about one and a half kilometers. <laughs> and then the number of times she gives this message is how excited she is about the new home. Mm. So other scouts will go and, 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 and visit, visit that and come back with the information. And as, you're talking, period, uh, as you're talking, I'm thinking, who needs Google Maps anymore? <laughs> <laughs> who needs a realtor? Yeah. Who needs a realtor? But, but this yeah. So fascinating this whole, marketing. <laughs> <laughs> this whole process is, yeah. is just uh, fascinating. And so she gets them excited, and then the others go and check it out. Yeah, yeah. And then gradually all the scouts will indicate that, yes, that is – is 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 the best site so it's kind um, of like a, they they kind of vote on it like a little democracy to say that's the one yeah uh, now when you have when you have six legs you know you know are there people that are cheating and putting up two arms to vote at the same time i don't know <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah so then then they depart as a swarm and they move in and but you see, then, then, then the rubber hits the road because not you know a small proportion of swarms survive to the next next year. I forget the exact number, but it's I think it's in the twenty or thirty percent range because they've got a lot of work to do. They've got to you know draw out all that comb. They've got to get resources. That queen has to start laying. And if she's an old queen, right, then they'll supersede her or they'll make a new queen so that they have a new queen going into the into the winter. So yeah, there's there's so many things going on. How, Steve, do they how, have? Uh, sorry, do they have predators? Natural predators? I'm just thinking birds. Yeah, maybe. yeah. yeah. Um, so 
So you have you have to remember that that that, that the honeybees that we have in, in North America, they're an introduced species, right? We're talking about the the European the European honeybee. So I think I think their their biggest predator that they have to worry about is man. And there are, are um, they found uh, cave drawings that I think as 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 as, er, uh, as early as uh, eight or nine thousand years ago they have drawings of people uh, climbing up trees r robbing honey. Um, uh, so, but you would you would certainly have animals like like bears and 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 raccoons and and that's why they try and choose a small opening and that's to to keep predators out. Um, certainly in 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 Africa, oh, is it the um, there's a bird, I don't know, is it the honey seeker or something like that, that, that will follow bees and actually has a symbiotic relationship with, with some of the uh, indigenous people in Africa and, 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 uh, and, and the, the bird leads the human to the, 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 the colony and, and, the, hu the, and, and, and the human then uh, shares the, the honey with, with, with the bird. I, I don't think I'm leading you down the garden path on, on, on that. It's been a while since I... I saw that, but I, th I thought that that was uh, what one of the. Uh, the how unique... long does how long does the queen uh, live for, Steve? Uh, up to if if you look at older texts, up to five years. Um, wow. Recently, um, you know, in, in 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 the last twenty or thirty years, certainly the comments are that the queens aren't living as long. Uh, the question being, is that nutrition? Is that exposure to, you know, uh, toxins in the environment, you know, pesticide residues, that, that sort of thing. Um, commercial beekeepers, depending on who you talk to, most people would, 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 would say you want to make sure you have a young, vigorous, healthy queen going into winter to ensure that that hive survives. Um, and so a lot, of, a lot of commercial guys will, will requeen every year because they don't want to take the risk of, of right. losing that hive. The problem is, is that queens are, uh, well, last year with COVID, they were difficult to come by because commercial flights were, were, weren't, were, were a problem. Um, and queens can be upwards of $45 now. So that's a significant expense. Um, there is... Uh, uh, a more of a effort to breed local queens. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is that in the Maritimes here, we can only start raising queens, you know, you know, June-ish, you know, because you have to wait for drones to mature. You have to wait for, um, you know, a good a good nectar flow. So, so our queens are later in the year. So, but for people who want to do splits or or or, or increase their colony numbers in April and May. Which is, and they're usually doing that in preparation for blueberry pollination in this part of the world. They need to bring queens in from either, um, um, you know, California, Hawaii, uh, Australia, New Zealand. But you're bringing in uh, a, a bees that aren't acclimatized to this area, and, and so the push has been to to breed local bees that that are 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 a better fit for, you know, our our climatic variations. So. So how do you get a, like how do you get a bee in the mail? How does that work? <laughs> Very carefully. Yeah. Uh, when I've ordered in the in the in the mail, Jeff, her mailman, he says he comes here first stop. He doesn't wait. <laughs> he just they drive him crazy. They they they're in a small little cardboard box. They've got metal screening on them so that they can ventilate themselves. Yeah. They're labeled, you know, live animals. These, uh, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, there's mailing packages and there's little mailing cages and uh, yeah, it's it's quite it's quite well done. But the problem is, is that if they get lost in the, I've 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 spent oh it was seven or eight hundred dollars for fifteen queens. Canada Post lost them and 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 the one survived for about yes. uh, two months. Yeah. Uh, that was an expensive fiasco, but. And it's dicey, right? Introducing, like I know you drive into Nova Scotia, there are big signs everywhere, yeah. do not yeah. import bees, right? And it's dicey yeah. bringing these new bees in and out, right? Yeah, so you, you, need, to, um, you, you need to get importation certificates from your uh, provincial apiarist. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a number of... Uh, there's numbers of hoops to jump through. I, I tend to now, um, uh, country fields in Nova Scotia, brings in in queens and I, I tend to go through them. I still need a certificate from 
from from Cameron here in the island to bring them across the border. But I, I I let I let them worry about you know talking to the breeders and bringing in the big 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 numbers of bees. Yeah. So, <laughs> how much of your uh, week in the summertime? Yeah. Would be or I guess any time of the year would be consumed with beekeeping. I ask this because it's fascinating stuff. It's very very interesting. I'm wondering how, like, if somebody took this on as a passion project, yeah. as a hobby, or even indeed wanted to contribute to the whole kind of uh, ecosystem of creating bees enough to support yeah. your location, how much work is involved? Well, um, so so the yeah, it 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 depends. Uh, if if you're just if you're interested. And then the, then the first thing to do is, is to contact your local sort of beekeeping organization. And on the island here, it's, it's, it's the PEI Beekeepers Association. Um, and, and it's a nice, nice way just to meet people, talk to people. And, and then, because the first thing you want to do is to get in contact with someone who can, who can mentor you. Yeah. Um, because a, a lot of us feel that we won't have done our job if we haven't interested you know one or two other people right. to, to, to carry on um, and so most of us are interested in in, in mentoring uh, people so you have to then uh, uh, it, it would then be best to go out and see a beehive and I've had lots of people come out from work we, we dress them up in their suits the kids come out the kids are great they yeah. have they have no fear they put on the suits they can spot the queen quicker than me and and it it's it, it is just fascinating to to see the the delight and the joy uh, that they get from 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 thing and the questions just just right. just phenomenal question you know and, and they're not superficial questions they're truly interested in what's what's going on at high so yeah so that, so so um, after someone expressed an interest, you know, then the thing is, is to, is to get out there and 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 see a, see a hive and sort of see what's involved. You know, and so I, I would take them through and um, they'd be dressed up. I'd, I'd show them how they open up a hive. I'd take out a frame. I'd, I'd, I'd show them the different, you know, the three different casts there, the drones, the workers, the queens, just, just to get them interested. And then five minutes later, they're, they're pulling out the next frame, right? The thing is, is, is to get them hands on as soon as soon as they can. And, 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 and get, it's not throwing them in the deep end. But it's it's there's there no point standing back ten feet yeah. and saying yeah this is what I want want to do, so right. if you get someone that that is enjoying that aspect of it, then then then, uh, yeah they they need to make a, a decision <laughs> because there is a little bit of a financial out 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 outlay in 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 that they would need to buy. Um, a basic starter kit and, and all, all the commercial um, beekeeping shops will, will sell a, you know, a beginner's kit with the hat and the veil and the suit and, 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 and the wooden wear. And it's a neat way to start because you're putting together the equipment, you're starting with nice new shiny stuff. And then the next spring, you can order a package or a, a, a nucleus hive, a small hive from one of your local beekeepers, install it in your, in, 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 in your equipment and then watch the first year as it grows. The, the usual advice is to start with uh, more than one, but less than five hives. Um, and, and you say more than one because you're always, you wanna be able to compare hives. If you don't have something to compare to, you won't know if something's going wrong with, with your hive. Right. And if you lost the queen in one, you could take eggs or, or you could take larva or eggs from the other one, pop it in and they, they, they'd make a new queen. So, uh, so yeah, you're probably looking at starting with 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 two hives. You need a mentor. You, you need a, uh, uh, a, a, a to make contacts with your local organization, and you need a lot of support the first two years. The number of I, I spoke of, you know, doc, Dr. Mundell, who was who was my my mentor. The number of times I called him in in a panic. I can't find the queen. I'm trying to make a split, Murray. What do I do? You know, and he's out. He's out 20 minutes later. Yeah. You know. Um, you know, uh, Murray slowed down a lot over the last couple of years, and and the person I bugged the most is uh, Dave McNerney, Dad's neighbor out in the blueberry fields. The poor fellow. I'm sure he's in the. I'm sure he's knee deep 
in, in, in something. And I call him up and chew his ear off for 45 minutes. And he doesn't say, you know, Steve, I, I, I got to get something done here, you know. No, just, just and, and that is the funniest thing. You go to a beekeeping meeting and, and it's, it's incredible. Within five minutes, you're talking to someone for 45 minutes that you haven't known, you know, and, and it, it's, just a, it's just a really neat ex experience talking to other people from different parts of the, the, the province, Canada, wherever. And it's, it's the same issues, same ideas, same passion. It's phenomenal. So you didn't answer your question because your wife must be in the background listening. But how many? <laughs> hours I was that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I missed that. <laughs> how many hours that. a week are you spending on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it depends on the on the time of the year. In in the spring, yeah, Heather and I'll I'll be out there probably two days a week. Yeah. Okay. We we wrapped about thirty hives this this fall, and we have some smaller nucleus hives that we're trying to overwinter queens in. And it's quiet. It's quiet now. I mean, I still go out and make sure that no lids are blown off and that sort of thing. But but come April, we'll be unwrapping them, and we'll have to check and see if they need some emergency feed. And it's the sort of thing if 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 things need to be done because there's a bit of a crisis, it has to be done. It done now and. And uh, um, yeah, so so it, it'll be one to two days a, a week um, when we move them to the blueberries. Um, that's 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 a, that's it's a busier time because you're moving them at, at night. Mm -hmm. um, but but you know, if if you were starting, you know, you wouldn't be doing that, and right. it would be more it would be more relaxed. And uh, Steve, yeah, I, I, I'm fascinated to hear you say that. The kids get so excited by it and stuff. Yeah. And I've often wondered why we don't introduce these things into our children's education. Yeah. Um, to yeah. Excite, because, I mean, as you know, and as Jerry knows as well, succession planning in agriculture is a very complicated thing. It's very difficult to get that next generation excited and encouraged about a really exciting uh, industry which we yeah. heavily rely on as Canadians and uh, it's fascinating to hear you say that the kids are so excited about it and I've always had the idea of uh, it would be so cool to create uh, a game around yeah. beekeeping yeah. and inject that game into the curriculum for school yeah. kids so that they could get excited about it and then at some point uh, during the school year, I should go out and gear up and see the bees. Yeah. And I, like, I mean, what a great way to introduce the next generation into, I mean, uh, something that is absolutely required, right? If this whole thing is going to yeah. work, yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's really interesting. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And in fact, you know, the struggles that young people have getting into agriculture now, in terms, I mean, if they can't inherit a family farm, you know, to buy land, mm. to, 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 to lease or buy equipment, yeah. and then to start and, and make a living, uh, I mean, it, it, I think it's, it's becoming impossible because you're seeing the rise of these huge corporate, you know, uh, conglomerates that, that are controlling agriculture now. And I really think uh, beekeeping agriculture is, is one way for young people to get involved with agriculture without a huge outlay in equipment, land, that sort of sort of thing. Um, yeah, we should have beehives on the roof of every school mm -hmm. and, and, and beekeepers should be going out, not entire classes at a time, but, you know, Mrs. Smith, you know, uh, in two, you know, two weeks, uh, I'll be visiting the school. Are there two or three people in your class that would like to join me up on the roof? Yeah. I mean, what a thing for these kids then to extract the honey and sell it, you know, and raise money for their, for their school. Yeah. Just so many neat things that could be done. But. 100%. I've got a question. Andy. Go ahead. Sorry, I've got a question kind of related to the study of, of the bees. Uh, being a scientific person, Steve, do you, do you have like uh, photography equipment, a microscope? Are you into that? Or are you just raising them without actually studying the the bodies of, of the bees? Yeah, so, um, so that's a whole other other rabbit hole. Um, 
certainly there's, there's, there's always been science um, involved with, with, with beekeeping. Yeah. Um, and and it, it's as, as simple as uh, splitting up your apiary, you know, and 10 hives uh, doing one thing and 10 hives doing another and, and you're doing the, you know, comparing, comparing the numbers. I, I think a lot of, a lot of beekeepers um, uh, go, I don't want to get, get in trouble here, but there's all, obviously time pressures, there's obviously commercial pressures, and, and, and a lot of people, I think, are going, go with um, their experience, what worked in the past, their opinions, that sort of thing. I mean, the, the, the joke is you ask 10 beekeepers one question and you'll get 12 different, different yeah. answers. Yeah. Um, so, so but, but that's not data. And, and you're seeing uh, uh, provincial uh, um, uh, research groups starting, like in Ontario, they have their tech transfer team and they do research they they synthesize the results and they pass that on to beekeepers at, at meeting. Uh, Perennia, uh, an agriculture research group in 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 in, in Truro, they they've started the Atlantic Technology Transfer Team for apiculture, and and the Maritime Province. And I think Newfoundland as well contribute financially to that, and they do they do excellent research. When we have meetings, they'll give presentations uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, of row of mite control, uh, pollination studies in, in blueberries, you know, nutrition studies. And that's, that's the sort of research that, that, that we need. There's um, all, all the, bee, the bee journals, you know, uh, um, will present scientific papers. Um, Randy Oliver, uh, uh, scientificbeekeeping.com, you know, he, you know his, his, his mantra is he doesn't put an opinion down uh, on his on his website, unless he can back it up with data that he's collected him, him, him himself. So there is more of a of, of a, I think a swing to trying to do stuff that that has uh, is is data or science science driven. Beekeepers have always been interested in the biology and the science. But the thing is, we're we're just trying to understand an, an insect that we. Real, they always surprise us. The more you're, you know, you, you, two years into the best, the best time to ask someone a question about bees is after they've been a beekeeper for two years because they've read lots and, 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 and they've got a little bit of experience. But the more you, you spend with them, the more you realize you, you, you don't know. So there's this constant um, search for, for more and more uh, information that, that, that we're seeing uh, being done. Um, Heather and I actually participated in a study um, uh, with, with, with the group in, in, in Truro on, on nosema, which is a parasite that inhabits the honeybee's gut. And there's been a transition between one species of nosema, nosema um, apis to nosema serrana. And, and the, the th feeling is that transition that probably happened two or three years ago was responsible for large overwintering uh, losses. Uh, but we, we helped collect data for that. Um, yes, I do have a microscope, <laughs> and uh, one of my plans was was to to, to take a course on uh, um, squishing bee abdomens and identifying parasites, but haven't haven't gotten to that yet. So, uh, I'm, uh, I got another follow up question to that. I'm a technology guy, so as you're yeah. talking, I'm thinking, wow, I would imagine, and I don't know this. Yeah. Um, technology that allows you to uh, a track temperatures within the hives yeah. videos live uh, yeah. is is that must have been that you know i would imagine that's expanding leaps and bounds and and do you have any of that stuff for yeah your hives? so so there are you do read articles about people starting to use thermal cameras to yeah. to, to to check their hives in the winter uh, certainly researchers that have done uh, wrapped up hives with temperature and I think humidity probes as well. Just yeah. all working on the thermodynamics in terms of what goes on in a hive. Um, but no, uh, yeah, no, I'm, 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 not, I'm not there yet in terms of that. Uh, I, did, I did buy one of those little uh, mechanics inspection cameras and uh, poked it in the, uh, the, the lower entrance in the winter to see if they were still in there. But uh, I got to learn to sit on my hands in the winter because the more you disturb them, they break their cluster and uh, right. I can't do anything to help them in February. So Heather, Heather tells me just to sit on my hands, but sometimes that's hard to do. 
I, I could see myself going down a rabbit hole. Like I love studying the weather and I'm buying devices yeah. to see what the humidity is outside and all that. If, if you were to start pushing out data about it, I could see myself going down that rabbit hole, <laughs> uh, you know, and studying them. So, but anyway. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think one of the big correlations that, uh, that, that, that we have to look at is uh, swings in temperature, particularly in this part of the country. Yeah. You know, you, talk, you, you read what beekeepers have to put up with in the prairies. You know, it's a long, cold winter, but they don't have those, usually don't have those swings into above, above zero degrees Celsius and, and rain, whereas we'll have, you know, a March where it's, it's snow and cold and then it's rain. And, and the bees don't like, don't do well with humidity. It's, it's starvation and, 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 and dampness that, that kills the bees. They can, tolerate, they can tolerate the cold. So, yeah, so correlating, uh, you know, uh, weather, weather events uh, with, with, with overwintering survival. You know that that that's something that 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 would be worth doing, but it's still varroa. The parasites are, are our biggest problem for over overwintering. And uh, okay, Steve, so you're in the operating room. I don't know how many times a week. A lot. How many people there know about this stuff? They yeah. must all know it by now, do they? They they know not to ask me any questions because <laughs> I'll go on for forty five minutes like this. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Have you inspired any of the other healthcare professionals to get uh, in beekeeping circles? I don't think any of them have, have taken up any, any beekeeping. Um, uh, one of the surgeons and one of the nurses came out with their kids, and they had a good time, so they've they've come out. One one of the one of the nurses wanted to 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 to, to have a hive in their backyard, and, and I would have been Heather, and I would have been happy to to drop one off. But it's a, she was sort of living in suburbia, and she didn't think one of her neighbors would appreciate that. But but the nice thing about talking about this subject and and realizing bees are pollinators is it gets you interested in what else is going on in there. You know, you know we've got thirty hives here. I step out the door. And, and I still, if I see a bee on a dandelion, I still stop and watch it. You know, I've got, you know, there's, there's I don't know how many gazillion are out there, but I'm still stopping and watching this one bee work. And then you notice the bumblebees. And then you, then you notice the, uh, you know, the, the ad, 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 andrina bees. And then, then you, you know, the, the orchard bees. And, and it opens up this whole other, other world. And, and all this, this talk about, uh, which has been good, you know, the focus on honeybees and, and the bees are dying and, and that sort of thing. But we've really been ignoring our native pollinators. And, mm -hmm. and, and people, uh, you know, say that, you know, different species of bumblebees are, are rare and endangered. And, and they don't know, we don't know what they were like 30, 40 years ago because the interest, you know, right. wasn't there. So for, for people that are interested in honeybees, um, but are, are living in areas where, where they can't have honeybees, there's so many other things to, that they can do to, 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 to uh, promote their interest in, in pollinators. And, and we've seen those uh, uh, tube nests, you know, for, for the um, orchard bee species. And uh, there's all sorts of, uh, there's a couple of books that I have on, on, on uh, uh, one's befriending bumblebees about, about their biology and, and making nests that they, they, they can move into. And uh, yeah, yeah, so, so it opens up a whole new world and, uh, and you can become involved in this world even if you can't uh, or you don't have the location of the resources to, uh, to, 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 to have honeybees. Just planting a pollinator garden. Yeah. You know. Steve, uh, there's a, there's a, a, it's a, this has been on my mind since we started talking. There's a four letter word <laughs> wasp. Where does the wasp play into all this? Um, well, wasps, wasps are part of our insect world, and, and the wasps here are, 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 are native uh, uh, species. Wasps, wasps, I think, are more, are, are not necessarily uh, poll pollinators. I mean, they're attracted to sugary. Okay, I didn't know that. I thought they were. Yeah, solutions. So you look at a, you look at a bumblebee, you look at a honeybee, and, and they're, they're, they're good pollinators because they're, they're so, so furry, 
right? Yeah. They land on a flower, they have a little electrostatic charge, and the pollen lands, uh, you know, is, is trapped by the, by the bristles. Most, most wasps and hornets that are very smooth, hard-shelled, you know, their exoskeleton isn't, isn't covered in, 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 in furs, in, 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 a, in a bristle or, or I say fur, fur is a mammalian thing, it's, it's not fur. Uh, but I think most wasps are predatory. Um, and uh, um, I don't know, you know, a lot about uh, wasp, uh, you know, I, I'm certainly no expert on, on, on wasp biology, but, uh, but you see uh, lots of wasp species that, that, that lay their eggs or predate on, on larva, that sort of thing. Of course, the uh, Asian giant hornet is, is, is in, in the news and, and it's, a, it's a predator uh, as, as, as well. So wasps, they're, they're, colonial, they're colonial insects. Uh, they don't store um, honey to, to survive the winter. It's, it's just uh, the queens that, the, that survive the, 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 the winter. Um, but, uh, but yeah, um, wasps can be a problem for, for honeybee eyes because they try and get in and steal the, the honey. Is it a four-letter word to bring up to a beekeeper? What? No, we, we've got worse. We've got worse parasites to to, to deal with. Varroa mite. If, if if someone could snap their fingers and make varroa, what might go away? Here on PEI, we're worried about the small hive beetle. Um, you know, because that'll cause cause problems uh, if, in terms of honey production and and, and honey harvest. There's apparently an even worse mite called a tropolalaps mite that is in Southeast Asia. And I, and I don't know the details around it. Uh, but yeah, beekeeping now is much, uh, much more different than it was 30 or 40 years ago with, uh, you know, the advent of tracheal mite and, and varroa mite. Heather, Heather's dad kept, kept bees and he would buy a package bee, I think from Georgia or Florida for five or $10, install it in a hive and then in September, you know, harvest the honey. There was, there was no attempt then uh, to, to overwinter the bees because the packages were so cheap. Right. Now, I'm, I'm not sure from an inflation point of view what 5 or $10 is today, you know, from, from, from the, the 60s, but uh, to order a package from New Zealand and Australia, I, I think it's uh, $220, $240. And, uh, so it's a substantial investment. And uh, the, uh, so the, the money in bee, I mean, the, 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 clearly clear, caring for the bees and all that, and yeah. that's where all the passion is. But it, it, from an economic standpoint, the, the return on investment, it's, it's more using your bees or renting your bees out to pollinate fruit fields, right? Yeah. And also honey, or is honey just a byproduct of all of that? Yeah, so um, uh, return on investment may not be the best word to okay. use <laughs> for me. Okay. But because I, I don't depend on it from, from no, my no, life, livelihood. Yeah. Um, but for commercial beekeepers or sideliners who, who, who do, uh, in the Maritimes, you really are depending on both pollination contracts okay. and a honey crop. Okay. If, if you look at, uh, um, so most of Canada's honey is produced um, from beekeepers out in the prairie provinces because they have these huge fields of, of canola, alfalfa, you know, and, uh, you know, we grow alfalfa here, but the farmers cut it down, you know, just when it starts to bloom because they want to maximize the protein content for their hay. When they're growing it for seed, they're obviously leaving the bloom as long as they can. And, and they have honey uh, crops of, you know, three and 400 pounds per hive. Our average on the island is about 40 pounds per hive. And if you sell that wholesale, the wholesale price for honey is about $2 a pound. So it, 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 it helps. Um, the pollination contracts for blueberries tend to run somewhere between $140 and $160 per hive. Right. So that's the model here on the island. It would be nice if we can uh, find a different, uh, a second pollination contract. So apples used to bloom a little bit before blueberries. Right. Now with our springs, they seem to be blooming about the same time of, as, as blueberries. Most of the traditional apple orchards don't require extra pollinators, but the new uh, high density trellised uh, orchards um, re re uh, uh, require pollinating. So there's a potential for a, a, an early pollinating contract there 
and then low bush, the wild blueberries. And now we're seeing more high bush blueberries planted on the island. So I'm not sure if they overlap with the low uh, bush blueberry pollination or if a little later. So we, there, there might be some potential for um, beekeepers to get an extra pollination contract. We really need to get into other seed crops on, yeah. on the island. Uh, five, six years ago, um, I forget the name of the company in Kensington, but they were growing borage. Right. Beautiful crop, beautiful honey. I think most beekeepers would give their left leg to see, you know, uh, borage fields across the island. Right. Um, so, and it was a later season, you know, it was in August, so perfect. Um, yeah. But we're fortunate now yeah, that we get a nice fall bloom of asters and goldenrod um, that other parts of the Maritimes don't get. So, right. um, I, got a, I got a quick question, Steve. Sorry yeah. for interrupting, but I got to understand what it is you're talking about when you get a pollination contract. Are you actually bringing your your hive to the area that? The, yeah. The, the, yeah. Okay. All right. I understand yeah. now. Yeah. No. But in no, the sorry, back I of the sh- pathfinder, or what do you do? <laughs> 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 With with your beekeeping yeah. suit on, of course. Yeah, yeah. Listen, I, I've had I've had the little Impreza loaded down with with bees. So uh, <laughs> no, we yeah. So so you are moving uh, when you talk about moving moving hives. You're generally moving it to uh, to uh, um, uh, crops that need to be pollinated. I think everybody's heard of the almond pollination in California. That sort of kicks off the beekeeping season in in the states. I think this this time of year or first of February, um, for PEI, the, the the big crop to pollinate is 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 blueberries. So yes, you're you're physically lifting that hive, putting it on a truck or a trailer, uh, moving it, and you generally do doing that at night when it's a little cooler. The bees are all in their hive, uh, and then putting the uh, the uh, hive in the, in the blueberry field somewhere for somewhere between 10 or, or 10 days 14 days i have a question for you steve i see beekeepers out there and when they're trying to i don't know work with the bees or calm the bees down they have this smoke yeah yeah why, why do the bees respond differently to that oh no that's not for the bees that's marijuana that's for the beekeeper <laughs> 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 no, no. So that 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 smoker, you're you're putting. Uh, most people, I think, would use straw or pine shavings or something like that. And what it does is it disperses the alarm pheromone that the bees um, uh, broadcast to, to say, you know, our our hive is being attacked, sort of thing. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, it also uh, causes them to go to the, the 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 honeycomb and they start gorging on honey. And I don't know if it's a reflex that, that, that they're saying, look, the forest is on fire and we might have to leave our home. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know. But, but you it, put that smoke into, into the air and they all kind of return to the, to the hive. So you'll see them. Uh, so if, if, if the bees are a little jumpy and, and they're at their entrance and, and, and they're coming at their entrance, if, if, you, if you puff a little smoke on the entrance, yes, the guard bees will go, go back in. Um, Jen, and if you take off the top cover of, of the hive, um, uh, if you have a gentle hive, they don't, they don't mind that. I mean, and this is what um, people try and do. They try and breed for gentleness, you know, because it's just no fun working in an extremely defensive hive. And the defensiveness, is, it, it's, it's, it's in their DNA because they have to d- defend their, their resources. But like any other trait, you know, uh, beekeepers have tried to reduce it or breed it out of, out of their bees. Um, so you take off that top lid, and if they're uh, uh, really jittery, or if they're they're bouncing off, they're coming off the top of the the, the hive and and sort of bouncing your veil, or they're looking upset. Then yes, you give them a couple of puffs of smoke. Okay. They they settle back down. You'll see them just go a little bit into their hive and 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 start to fill up their 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 honey stomachs with with honey or nectar and uh, they've calmed down a little bit. You'll pull a frame out, uh, you know, do what you need to do, uh, pull a second frame out. If, if their heads, if the heads start coming, you know, if the heads start coming up above the parapet, then you give them another little puff and they, they, they retreat a little bit. Right. But you know, most, most days we don't need to use a lot of smoke. Right. Um, and, and you're actually gentler um, without gloves because um, your, your, your dexterity is there and you, know, you can feel the bees. So the problem is, is if you squish them, 
a squisher, then, then, then she releases an, an alarm pheromone that gets things, things going. So the more gentle you are, uh, the, the, the better it is. And, and, and we have the luxury of, of, of doing that because we're, we're not, you know, uh, commercial. Yeah. Uh, you know, commercial guys, they'll go to their 30 high vape period. They've got two hours to get through, put, put, put protein patties in or do what they do, and then get to the next A period. So, yeah. Yeah, I guess, I guess like that's the same uh, concept as if a bee is coming around you and you're swiping away at it. Yeah. It, it gets active. And if you just leave yeah. it alone, bees, I find yeah. that bees just aren't interested in you. I mean, they might circle around and take off. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Once, you know, once they're out of the hive, their mind's on other things, right? right? They're out there to do, do, do a job. The only thing that they're trying to defend is the entrance, entrance to, to their hive. Yeah. And if they don't associate your footsteps or the vibration of your truck driving up into the, the bee yard with getting jostled and thrown around, they're, they're not going to be upset at things. Yeah. Um, we have uh, the, the, the bee inspectors that come over from New Brunswick, Fletcher and Mary Cole Pitts. Um, they, they, they're, uh, they, they, they come and inspect uh, our hives like every two years. It's a provincial program, um, you know, uh, in terms of IPM disease surveillance and that sort of thing. They're just such a fabulous uh, uh, source of, 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 of knowledge and I've learned so much uh, from them. And in fact, as you as as you go further down this road, you, you transition more from um, where's the queen, where's the queen, where's the queen to what is the health of my hive? How do the larvae look? Mm. Is there anything I should be worried about in terms of uh, of of this brood pattern? That trying to pick up problems early and uh, and identify problems. Anyways, they they were they were the ones that to put me onto it is that they can tell who the gentle beekeepers are, you know, just right. by walking into the hive wow. or w walking in, into the, the bee yard. Yeah. yeah. You know? And uh, so it's, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of neat. Yeah. yeah. Well, I got to tell you, this has been fascinating for me and Jerry, I'm sure it's been the same for you. I guess what I've come to learn is that uh, I guess the white house was an active hive for the last four <laughs> years and now it's become a gentle hive. And all we really needed was just little puffs of smoke. Yeah, that marijuana smoker smoke would have done it. <laughs> that yeah. would have settled things down. Steve, it's, uh, look, I, want, I can't begin to thank you enough for spending oh, uh, an hour uh, on Gale Force Winds with us. It's fascinating, yeah. right? And I always enjoy when yeah. somebody is so passionate about a topic and, and their desire to kind of tell people about it. I, I find this very interesting my big takeaway from it was that we had the, the next generation they need to get they need to see and touch and feel this yep. experience this however we do that whether that's through gamification at the beginning mm -hmm. and then bring them out or as you say just put them in the schools and yep. let the let the kids have a go at it because it's such an important thing for them to understand and and furthermore it's just really fascinating yeah. to understand yeah. how that colony operates jerry any thoughts before we clue it up i honestly never thought i'd be this interested in bees but uh you know what steve you've really outlined for me just uh, it's a fascinating world and i think we all need to stop and smell the roses so to speak yes. you know yeah very very true it's it's about a way to to, to, to reconnect. Uh, so I mean, Steve, uh, we always ask our guests, uh, people that have, you know, are doing interesting things. Uh, yeah. They live in small parts of our country and uh, they're thriving, right? And uh, we always ask our guests to leave the audience, you know, with one small takeaway, whatever that might be, whatever's important to you. And um, and, 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 I'd, and I'd throw that to you now. And what would that one take away from the life of Steve Farmer, who's an anesthesiologist by day and a rugby player occasionally, dipped your foot in military service and a family man, you're a jack of all trades. What is, and a very passionate beekeeper. What is your one piece of advice? I'm not sure I recognize this Stephen Farmer you're talking about, but um, <laughs> my, my one piece of advice, I, I, I think it is just uh, to take a moment, um, uh, appreciate, go outside your door, 
um, sit down in your backyard and just appreciate what you what you have. Appreciate what's around you. Yeah. Um, and and for 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 me, that's that's to go out in the apple orchard, um, sit down and watch uh, a whole different world. Watch those bees go back and forth. Um, just it's incredibly relaxing, and, and and it puts our lives in perspective sometimes. You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that's. Tremendous advice, Jerry, isn't it? Absolutely. I love it. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the number of people, Steve, that we've had on this uh, podcast, it's uh, the wide variety of topics, uh, the good, the challenging. This is just, uh, you know, I love sitting in the garden. And when you think about it, you know, we didn't get into growing things, but if you grow something in your garden, it's something that's always fascinated me. Dirt creates flowers, trees, yeah. you know, and then yeah. the, the flowers on the deck and you see the bees. I love it. Thanks for, for being on. I just appreciate um, the listening. And I hope, you know, our listeners enjoy it as well. All right. Well, that's uh, another episode of Gale Force Winds, and I can't begin uh, to thank you enough, Steve. It's been a fascinating journey into the world of beekeeping to understand that a little bit better, and I hope our guests uh, enjoy it just as much. I always like to leave our guests uh, to say that, you know what, at the end of the day, the world needs more guys like Steve Farmer around. Thanks for joining Gale Force Winds, Steve. Thanks, uh, Jerry. Thanks, Alan. I've got suits for both of you when you come over. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to Gale Force Winds. That's Gale Force Winds, W-I-N-S dot com. <laughs>